Well, good evening, Council. We do have a couple of public hearings this evening, so we'll start with those. I will call the May 11th, 2021 public meeting, public hearing uh, to order. First item on the agenda is the adoption of today's agenda. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett, any additions? Shouldn't be, it's a public hearing. All in favor? It's carried. I do have a public hearing statement to verbalize this evening. Today's public hearing, dated May 11th, 2021, held in the Village of Valmont Ch Council Chambers at 735 Cranberry Lake Road in Valmont, BC. This public hearing is being convened pursuant to the terms of the Local Government Act, prior to consideration of two items. Number one, Street Vendor Permit 0321, Alternative Location Application, and two, the Village of Valmont Official Community Plan Bylaw Number 843-2021. At a public hearing, any person present who believes that they are affected by a matter being considered shall be given an opportunity to be heard on the matter contained in the proposal. Members of the public speaking to the proposal should, at the appropriate time, commence your address to this council by stating your name and area of residence, at which time you may then give us the benefit of your views concerning the proposal. Anyone who deems their interests are affected shall be given the opportunity to be heard at this meeting. No one will be or should feel discouraged or prevented from making their views known. All who submit comments at this public hearing will restrict their remarks to matters contained in the proposal. And it is my responsibility as chairperson of this meeting to ensure that all remarks are so restricted. At the conclusion of a public hearing, council may, without further notice, give whatever effect council believes proper to the representation made at the hearing. For item four, proposed alternative location for street vendor permit number 0321 at 1175th Avenue, the Funky Goat Eatery. We do have a presentation by staff under 4.1 by Ms. Shepard, our Deputy Corporate Officer. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? I hear you just fine. Perfect. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the first item on tonight's public hearing agenda is the Funky Goat Eatery's application for a street vendor permit requesting to operate at an alternative location, meaning a location not already approved in the street vendor bylaw. Street Vendor Permit 0321 proposes to allow the Funky Goat Eatery to operate for up to three years, seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. at 1175th Avenue between the Rocky Mountain Goat and Three Ranches Brewery. The property is legal, legally described as Lot 2, District Lot 9778, Caribou District Plan, PGP 35390. Owner of the Funky Goat, Mr. David Grant, was previously given approval to operate at this location from 2017 to 2020 and wishes to continue the same in 2021. At the regular council meeting of April 13th, council gave initial approval for the proposed street vendor location. Since then, adjacent property owners have been notified of the proposal and affected residents have been invited to provide feedback via written submissions to the village office or at this evening's public hearing via the village's YouTube channel. As of noon today, there were no written submissions received from the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. On this matter under 4.2, have we received written submissions? I haven't re received any, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any verbal presentations under 4.3? In the case of an electronic uh, from members of the public in the case of an electronic meeting comments submitted to YouTube since the commencement of the public hearing will be read aloud at this time. No comments have been received. Thank you. Do we have a presentation by the applicant under 4.4? He is not present this evening. Thank you. Therefore, he cannot respond to questions or comments raised by the public under 4.5. So do we have any questions by council under 4.6 for either the planning staff, the deputy corporate officer? 
On to item five, the official community plan bylaw number 843-2021. Under 5.1, we do have a presentation by staff by Miss Eddie, our planner. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, Miss Shepherd. You're welcome. The village of Elmont is oh, sorry. <laughs> the village of Elmont has undergone a major update and rewrite of our official community plan and is also finalizing the new zoning bylaw. Uh, MBH Urban Planning and Design Incorporated was hired to undertake this project starting in May 2020, and they will be presenting here shortly. The updating of these bylaws addresses some major concerns that have been identified within the village of Elmount. The increasing unaffordability of housing, homeowner and development limitations due to inflexible and out-of-date zoning and OCP regulations, limited pedestrian and transportation connectivity, and the lack of industrial and employment lands for job creation and economic diversification. The village of Elmount has also struggled with flat population growth, minimal development, commercial investments, and far-reaching infrastructure with a limited tax base, which increases property taxes per capita over time. The, this official community plan and the upcoming zoning bylaw are tackling these issues by increasing flexibility and permissions within the land use designations and zones. We have introduced mixed use areas to promote infill and vibrancy in our commercial centers. The addition of employment lands and light industrial zones provide significant opportunities for live work developments, economic diversity and sustainability, as well as the potential to increase property tax revenue and local job creation opportunities. A parking strategy has been developed to reduce congestion and increase access to the core village center. And a new trail network is proposed to connect the beautiful natural areas surrounding this community, as well as increasing the connectivity, pedestrian safety and tourism appeal within the village. It was identified that the village has a significant amount of vacant land that could be generating more revenue if developed. This has spurred further discussion of revitalization tax exemptions in commercial areas to promote development, as well as supporting residential infills, such as permitting accessory dwelling units and increasing the flexibility in zoning and home-based business regulation. Infill utilizes existing assets and resources while reducing hurdles to more affordable housing and housing types. It promotes more development opportunities and flexibility and encourages a more vibrant downtown core. Additionally, the creation of a master plan for the village's large vacant Ash Street parcel by the high school is a significant step forward for the village to take initiative in regards to development, employment, and housing opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Under 5.3, uh, we'll now have written submissions or summary submissions received prior to the proceedings. Yeah, we received one submission from John Grogan at 880 Hillside Drive. I will read that now. Uh, preface, research consistently shows that the process underpinning democratic consultation exercises is unrecognized for its potential to enhance democracy or undermine it. With democracy under increasing attack, establishing effective democratic consultation principles at the local level, which is where most people are interested in participating with political structures, is vital. The urgency and importance of this unrecognized need is only going to increase as more people become familiar with and willing to utilize tools of social media to express their discontent. Posting public engagements and consultations is, that genuinely welcomes and supports citizens Meaningful input is easier said than done, but it can be done. We are fortunate here that we have citizens with suggestions, wisdom, lived experience, and the commitment to want, part, want to be part of the planning for a better future, who wish to be part of building a better future for the village of Belmont. That is Teresa Healy, PhD, adjunct professor, School of Environmental Planning and Gender Studies at UMBC. But we have not realized this need and the opportunity it offers. In fact, on the contrary, I have observed a continual decline to opportunities for public discourse in the democratic process. For example, the legislated extension of terms of elected municipal office challenges to full public participation in meetings of mayor and council. The use of voting machines in municipal election in a village with a population of approximately 1,000, including children. I believe we could reverse that here. 
This would mean overall slowing down and reshaping our OCP process. Admittedly, this would not necessarily be at the convenience of the contractors, and there may be other considerations unimaginable to this observer. I am nearing my com the completion of my 70th orbit of the sun. I recognize that I am of the age where I have to be cautious of telling Grandpa Simpson stories, but I am also fully aware that as an elder, I have a responsibility and obligation of citizenship to speak my truth. I turn to the wisdom of the likes of Gordon Sinclair who put the question, how much did that cost? And Dave Broad performance did not hold back in expressing his unique perspectives. I will not be around for the next OCP cycle rebirth and hope to survive this pandemic and its variants. I might be argued that we are in an existential, existential crossroads of crisis, if not as a species, at least in our economic status quo. The globalization of the leisure class is presently in crisis and none are assured in their confidences that the tourism economy will recover. The world economies are in flux. I refer you to the book, After the Crash, The Emergence of the Rainbow Economy by Guy Donsey. Mr. Donsey explores a variety of system failures and although pandem a pandemic does not appear to be in the index, it is certainly a condition that could launch us into crisis that he describes in detail and to some solutions that might be helpful to soften the potential for devastation. On page one, paragraph one, he states in part, there is not just one crisis, there are four. The world economy of global debt, the global environment, and of community collapse. Written in 1988, it does not delineate a fifth crisis of dynamic pandemic. There are, we are in a position to write that chapter now in how we adapt or not. I offer that we are not in a position to entertain the second option. As a child, I was a Boy Scout. The motto, be prepared, has served me well over the years. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst, might be another way of putting it. The scientific method includes essential elements of the null hypothesis and peer review. I think those same principles might well apply to the social sciences generally and in the instance of the official community plan process before us. This is my gift to my community. We can do better than the proverbial frog in the frying pan, unable to move despite the heat building. Reasons for slowing down and doing it better. One, COVID-19 should have shut down the process until such time that the process methodologies were developed to mitigate a world otherwise on lockdown. COVID has impacted the community severely. Brain cloud isolation, citizens struggling economically have no time for OCP while the house of cards falls in. We are all in the same storm. We were not in the same boat. Depression and retreat from the outside world, disconnect from family and community relationships. These circumstances are, are not the best in which to be undertaking work to build a, pro, a positive future. Rather, an OCV process launched as a welcome back event when it's safe to go outside again would help rebuild relationships and hope. Two, necessity for broader vision. For example, tourism was offered in previous OCPs as a means to diversify the economy in light of challenges in the forestry sector. We need to continue to tap into the views of a cross-section of residents with ideas for diversifying our economy, not just the economic business sector. Three, problematic structures of consultations to date further marginalize community members and need to be redesigned to allow full cross-sector of interests and perspectives if they are to be expressed safely. I'm aware of the work of the School of Environmental Planning at UMBC, which works diligently to ensure students have ex experiential learning as part of their curricula. We have had two successful initiatives, including the founding of the Three Valley Community Development Cooperative. This is one example of an inexpensive support we could be calling on to improve our OCC process that would be most welcomed by the school and provide us with professional through apprentice support we could afford. I highly recommend we slow down our OCP and make it a community building endeavor rather than lip service exercise of strategically building the economic but no other sector of our community. Reflections and observations. The following reflections and observations are a compilation of notes largely made prior to the recent Zoom Facebook open house offered in lieu of a face-to-face -face event. My concerns revolve in my belief that momentum of a faulty process may have already set the direction and velocity of the outcome. My notes may ruffle some feathers, but they are offered in 
aggregate to prompt honest dialogue. It should be noted that there are some matters that have been left out which might be better addressed in camera. I reserve the right to make further comments should other related matters emerge. Notes. Each successive OCE, with its arguable shortcomings in effectively engaging the entire community, reverts to a more privileged subset. The well-heeled, as it were, to express their personal bias to further advantage. This becomes a convenient habit of process that enables an incremental focus in one direction. This process is being repeated in multiple municipalities across the province, some worse than others. These OCPs are mandated by law, but perhaps the law itself is not specific enough to ensure sacred trust to be heard in the public forum. Is there an accreditation process to measure results? The use of open houses where people drop in over the course of hours to mill around and look at the displays of the perimeter of the hall and chat with the proponents is no suitable substitute for a town hall meeting to hear and be heard, exploring the full complement of vision for the commons. A public hearing is at the other end of the process, too formal and to enable open discussion or debate. No opportunity to hear others' opinions, nor of being heard. This is a dangerous condition which further generates poverty and oppression in, of the human spirit. This lack of adequate process is a stunning example of patriarchal groupthink for the betterment of the few. The OCP official community plan must not become in effect an OBP official business plan. Previously updated in 2006, public involvement in the Belmont OCP project is key to ensure chosen strategies, policies, and regulations reflect citizens' current vision for the community and address present-day concerns. I fear nothing could be further from the truth. This OCP exercise is a sham and a series of pretend public engagements going through the motions of social engagements. The data reported in the What We Heard report draft directions November-December 2020 might prove out my assertion. It appears that the process was skewed by an overrepresentation of business interests and an underrepresentation of social interests and values. There also appears to be a failure in respect to the rural values in favor of more urban bias created in a cookie cutter template offered by the consultants. The public cons consultant process was further complemented, complicated by the trappings of the global pandemic of COVID-19, creating a vacuum of citizen engagement with meaningful discussions and debates, enabling freedoms of associations with like-minded communities of interest in anything other than business development. The OCP in this instance might be better called an OBP, Official Business Plan. There was, in the early days of the process, a token hint of public engagement. I personally jumped through the offered hoops, not unlike a train circuit fair. I filled in the workbook offered by email address to keep informed and attended the COVID compliant public process. I imagine my disappointment in, the never, in never receiving a follow-up phone call to discuss my observations, interests, and concerns. This is not my first rodeo. I attended village council meetings consistently for 15 years. I have lived in this community for more than 40 years. I contributed to the social order associated with community development with demonstrated leadership roles in startup activities such as VCTV, the Internet Society, the Canoe Valley Community Association, the Three Valley Community Development Cooperative, the Youth Society, etc. From my perspective, my contribution to this OCP process is not reflected. Further, I contend that a subset of business interests is overrepresented in the results of this exercise. This is self-serving and sometimes contrary to the collective will of the community. I have to question the very integrity of the public survey. What measures were taken to ensure that the online survey was not completed repeatedly using different unique devices? This behavior was observed and encouraged in voting for best snowmobile community and other social media competitions. For example, on page four of the most recent document, what we heard report draft directions, November to December 2020, Core Village Center, CBC, consider tax rebate incentives to draw a development downtown area, reduce taxes for the first few years while development is being established. The downstream effect is that everyone else will see tax increase and or a reduction of services to cover the shortfalls. This is just one telling instance suggest, to suggest that what we heard was not representative of all interests. 
The result, without extraordinary measures, will be a more urban gentrification, creating a less affordable community for many residents. This will cause displacement of some of our neighbours and friends. The COVID-19 pandemic has created extraordinary conditions of social isolation that might further arguably have skewed the data collected by the contractors and reflected more favorably to the ultimate decision makers. I think it can be demonstrated that there has been a cookie cutter approach to the process of public engagements that further bias the findings to the business core to the detriment of interest of residential, social infrastructure and amenities. Example, dental care, community center, etc. I participated in three public gatherings called by the contractors, all cent centered around the business core. I suggest that this approach was further disincentive for marginalized community members from representing their best interests and in creating a vision for themselves and their families. The first exercise was a meeting of a small group of individuals, around 10 to 15. We walked together for a block and a half before stopping briefly, then calling it a day. Vehicular traffic noise created an unwelcome distraction and interruption for any meaningful dialogue. Another exercise was held in the park. There was little, if any, opportunity to hear or be heard from other community members. This is another condition that impedes development of social cohesion, expression, and association. The final venue I heard was of was a vacant lot between the newspaper office and the craft brewery. It was at best marginally useful. Traffic noise was a distinct distraction, prompting the principal facilitator at one point to blurt out something to a particularly loud pickup truck. The crowd also consisted of random patrons about of the outside tasting room of the brewery. There were post-it notes available for those who wished to comment on the storyboards that were displayed with the artist rendition of the vision of the contractors offered. Social distancing was difficult at best, and I had to com had no confidence that the post-it notes would make it back to the office due part in part to wind. A search of my email inbox confirmed my concerns that emails from the Belmont OCP were sparse. To their credit, there was to be an open house on November 23rd. That was canceled the morning of due to COVID-19. I received nothing further directly from the Valent OCP until January 8th, 2021 with the subject line, thank you for participating in our survey. In the past, I have heard the axiom, decisions are made by those who show up. My concern is reflected in the reciprocal. Decisions are made by those who are invited. We're invited it includes welcomes. My questions include, how many meetings were held in this process and who attended? I did not appear to have been invited to any of said meetings, nor did I receive any minutes. I asked myself, who was invited? I asked these questions in part because my experiences in the past where there have been top heavy processes and where those with a vision other than the prevailing one are marginalized by design. The virtual presentation of the draft official community plan and zoning bylaw scheduled on Monday, March 8th was a failure beyond description. Whoever administered the Zoom meeting might have managed for those who allegedly Zoom bombed the meeting, causing the meeting to be shut down before it started. All microphones can be muted until there is a reason for other than presenters to speak. Likewise, cameras can be disabled until needed if necessary. The notification of a rescheduled virtual open house was received on Friday, March 12th at 10.09 a.m. This notice does not meet minimum standards for notice. I received it because I am on the mailing list. The notice stated in part highlighted below. Please email us ocp at bailmont.ca or reply to this email prior to Sunday, March 14th to pre-register. A Zoom link and password will be emailed out to subscribers on Monday. I have to put the question of proper notice and access to reasonable access. Pre-register prior to Sunday, March 14th amounts to by Saturday, March 13th. How is this reasonable notice? At 11.55 a.m. on Monday, March 15th, I received login instructions for the 5.30 p.m. Zoom event. I am thinking that under the circumstances described, I will not log in while others in my community are excluded. I also have concerns that my presence at this late date will be seen as a tactic endorsement of this process. The exclusive use of internet technologies creates a digital divide of and for civic engagement. And by extension, it can be argued that this exclusionary for a subset of the community to equal access of democratic participation. 
Likewise, any notification offered on the Voyant Alert cell phone app is dependent on the financial and technological commitments and abilities. I, for one, do not have a cell phone. I might be, it might be interesting to learn what percentage of residents of Belmont have installed the Voyant Alert app. This community is unique in that it has publicly funded community access television. When I addressed the option to broadcast live to BCTV, I was advised that BCTV said they could not do that. This is another frustration to public engagement. BCTV was able to live broadcast 20 years ago, and it did. It could do so today if there was a political will. I monitored the BCTV bulletin board from 2.15 until 2.45 p.m. on Monday, March 15th, and there was no notice about the OCP public meeting this evening. On that venue, this is inexcusable. If COVID taught us one thing, it's that we need to pivot our status quo group think mentality. Ego, ergo, I go is no way to behave in the public sphere. In the absence of information, false narratives become reality. There does not appear to be a plan B or plan C, COVID. The narrative of diversifying our economy in the previous crisis of the collapsed forest industry has pivoted into a tourism mono economy that is not being adequately addressed by this overpriced and under, underrepresented official community plan. COVID variants or other unique pandemic could come along tomorrow. What relief from disaster does this plan offer? Diversity of the economy is similar to diversity of opinion in this instance. I do not see either in this plan. Does this plan address or even acknowledge the reality of dangerous commodity unit trains at track speed with two uncontrolled crossings? Does this plan address policing costs? Does this plan or the Unnubious bylaws rewrite address keeping backyard hens, industrial tax base, cost benefit analysis, food security, mass migration of urban dwellers fleeing natural or man made devastation. In conclusion, I wish to acknowledge that I may be in error on some point or another, but my expressions of interest in hearing all voices in their choir include the drunk in the back row and the otherwise disenfranchised and otherwise marginalized persons including children and families. These observations are offered in the spirit of goodwill to the democratic process. Anything less is in danger of becoming an official cabal plan. I think the provincial taxpayer and the government that administers the purse string should expect much, much better. And he added an addendum. It is with regret that I neglected to humbly acknowledge that I am a settler who graciously lives and works and plays on the traditional unceded territory of the Simp and Tlaile First Nations. In this time of COVID pandemic, it may be fitting to pause in reflection of past and continuing grievous harms suffered by others by our illusions of privilege and entitlement. An acknowledgement of previous historic diseases of the body and spirit introduced post-contact is essential to truth and reconciliation and ultimately to the healing of all parties. I contend that it is not sufficient to utter the words of acknowledgement without incorporating it deeply as an integral and overreaching element of who we are and who we hope to be. We find ourselves in a time of rising bigotry, hatred expressed and perpetuated systemically by individuals against Indigenous people, people of Asian heritage, and other people of color, LGBTQ2, and due to conditions of economic status. I offer that there is an opportunity for community development beyond the otherwise legislated obligations of the process. There's presently a set of circumstances that might frame an official community plan as a triple bottom line model accounting for social, environmental, and economic values. We need to ask ourselves, what is missing in this draft plan and in this process beyond meaningful engagement? Measure environmental impacts in terms of the principle of seven generations, appreciation of the value of arts, values inventory and celebration of cultural diversity, any SWOT analysis, the potentials of cooperatives and other economic alternatives. This plan has an opportunity to acknowledge the historic and continuing contributions made by Métis people of this municipality and area. Beyond recognition and keeping in mind the axiom of nothing about us without us, there may be opportunities to explore the community, economic development, and cultural potentials of the Métis, and, Métis Historic and Cultural Center of National Significance. 
We are geographically well positioned as the service center of Tijan Cat Historic Landmark. Salmon enhancement opportunities were also overlooked. What else might have been overlooked by too small a sampling of groupthink? Page two is is a copy of preliminary notes from the OCP 2021 shared with organizers. And his new notes include, not everything can be measured has value. Not everything that has value can be measured. I see a growth bias. I see an urban bias. Gentrification displaces my neighbors. Mountain culture is lip service, rinse and repeat. I love living in a village. Valley of broken dreams. Villages and assets. No more fast food, make economy. What effort has been made to engage low-income residents? COVID clusters. This is no time for an official community plan. Where is the town hall meeting? I want an inclusive community debate. We do not have a community center or neighborhood house. No dentist, we had one until recently. We do not need another realtor's dream OCP. Where are the neighbors? Did you consult with minimum wage employees? Too many bylaws in our village and chickens. That is all. Thank you very much, Ms. Eddie. Are there any under 5.3? Are there any verbal presentations from the public? So, in the case of an electronic meeting, this one, comments submitted to YouTube since the commencement of the public hearing. I'm just going to double check. Thank you. No. Not. Oh. no. Thank you. We have a presentation under 5.4 by the uh, MVH Urban Planning for this Village of Elmount official community plan. Uh, good, e good evening, uh, uh, Mayor, members of council. It's a it's, we're really delighted to be here. Uh, it's a very important date. Uh, my name is Michael Von House and I'm president of MVH Urban Planning and Design. I'm joined by Jonathan Schmidt, uh, Amy Clark, and Fraser Blythe, who uh, are here to support. And Jonathan will provide a brief presentation following my introduction. First, my team would like to extend a sincere thank you to all those who helped us along the path of developing the official community plan. As we just heard, it takes a community to build a village. First, great appreciation for the collaboration efforts of staff from the village, including Megan Vincente, uh, Silvio uh, Gisalemberte, and uh, Wayne Robinson, as well as Krista Eddy. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for your support through the process. Thank you to Council for your active participation and support, um, led by Mayor Owen Torgensen. Thank you very much. Councillors Holly Blanchett. Sherry G, Donnie McLean, and Pete Pearson. You were there all the way along the process in these difficult times. Finally, thanks to the support committee who helped guide the process and the community for participating in these very challenging times, as we just heard. The OCP project began in the spring of 2020 and has been one of the village's most extensive engagement processes despite the challenges of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic. The OCP provides Vailmont a strong vision for a promising future with focus on a vibrant uh, center village and enhancement of the village's existing character, keeping the scale and uh, supporting the community meeting place. The village's future looks bright. The hard work begins now with council staff and the community helping shape that future. I would like to now call on Jonathan Schmidt of our team to provide a short summary of the OCP and its principal directions from here. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And just wondering who has the presentation I can present from my screen or if there is an administrator on, then I will leave it to them. I guess I can present my screen if that's... Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. As Michael said, it's been a real privilege to be part of this official community plan process. And it was a great privilege to work with Megan throughout the process. Um, and she was a great asset and uh, an expert planner. And so we're sad to hear that she moved on from her job, but very excited to work with Krista as we also finish up the zoning bylaw. Krista brings a lot of understanding of the village knowledge and expertise. And so we're happy that you found someone uh, in-house that can bring that to the official community plan in implementation as it, as it moves ahead. So just first like to acknowledge the unceded territory of, of the Sim First Nation. So as I've said before in presentations, the OCP is very important. There's a lot of plans within each, each municipality and especially within the village. Here's a list of them. And so the OCP, where should it sit? Well, it should sit at the top and it is very important. It is the preeminent plan within the village. And so it guides, you know, budget, strategic planning, it guides the zoning bylaw, asset management, village policies. It's really a key guiding, the key guiding document. And it's the vision. And so I always say the OCP should be put in its proper place. And so that's, that's at the top. Um, underneath you know council's direction and if you're looking for a guidebook in terms of what to do as council then the OCP is that is that guidebook and that vision so where have we come from as mentioned the process began in May May 2020 June 2020 and so we are here now at the end in uh, approximately 11 months later which uh, as Michael knows from his years in the planning world, it's actually a fairly com you know, complex, compressed process. And uh, we've done a lot in that time. Uh, once again, what does it mean to you? It is the key vision document. And as mentioned by previous speakers, it was last updated in 2006. So the village is facing uh, what you could summarize as four key challenges as mentioned by Krista's uh, words there, flat, flat population growth means that um, as infrastructure ages, each person or each taxpayer pays, pays more. So um, if you don't grow, then the infrastructure ages and those that are you know, still in the village need to pay for that aging infrastructure. And how is it gonna be going to be paid for? Well, one opportunity is growth, but growth within reason and growth appropriately scaled and sized. And so that was a long discussion within the project in the engagement. Second, uh, as mentioned, there's plenty of vacant land, lots of speculative land holdings. Housing affordability was heard as a key topic throughout the project, a, a key challenge for the village. And this seasonal tourism economy, the ups and downs of it, how does the village weather that? How do they, how do you create a resilient village that can withstand that seasonal economy? So where, where challenge exists, so does opportunity. So four opportunities, which are probably well known to many of you now, but guide, uh, you know, the OCP and uh, the village as it, as it moves forward. So the village is attractive to creative entre entrepreneurs, mountain adventures, as you well know. Um, unaffordable housing in the big centers, the Kelowna's, the Vancouver's, is pushing people out of those areas. And Valemount is a very favorable place for those uh, people moving out of those situations. Remote work opportunities are growing and the sharing economy, you know, things like Airbnb and other sharing economy opportunities um, provide some economic opportunities perhaps within the village. So in terms of engagement, this is a brief summary. We can go into it more if there are questions, um, but many of you were part of these, um, but for the public record, uh, there were extensive workshops in July and September. There were these community circles kits, which was uh, about a 10 page brochure with questions and information. Um, that went to, I, I believe, approximately 700 residents. It was handed out to 
approximately 700 residents within the village. And so while um, I believe there's maybe 80 to 100 respondents, you can think that most people in the village uh, either browse one or, or it was sitting on their coffee table or their kitchen table. At one, one point in time, and that educational piece was really embedded within the process. So key themes that were heard, maintaining the village feel was a really key theme, um, keeping the quality of life in that village charm. And so the OCP was really, in the policies that were drafted, really guided by that. And you'll see that if you look, look through it, affordability, uh, seniors housing, connectivity and trails was, was key. And this idea of providing flexibility with mix, mixed uses and flexibility with zoning, which which we're working on with the draft draft zoning bylaw. And a host of other comments um, that we've listed, just some of them here, but there is more extensive um, reporting within those what we heard reports. So the OCP is summarized with two key goals. One is enhance the village for residents. We wanna make sure that um, in this uh, idea of looking to the future that we look to the current community first and in and, and that was a that was a theme throughout a lot of ocps and a lot of community planning says how do we attract that next next group of people well we don't want to get ahead of ourselves here we want to make sure that enhance the village for residents and then the second goal is that attraction piece um, to maintain that that vibrancy within the village and and people are knocking on the doors doors of Mount, and so how do you accommodate them in an appropriate way that doesn't lead to those gentrification um, negatives that were mentioned? I think there's a lot of opportunity to make that a positive. If you bring people into the community, it doesn't have to be a negative. It can be a, be a real positive if done right, and that strong sense of community maintained. So we, we developed 14 key priorities for action. And I won't go into them all as, they're, as they are listed within the plan. And they highlight uh, a few of the things I already mentioned, which is infilling those, those vacant lands. Those vacant lands within the village, which represent a significant geographic land base within the village, represent an opportunity to, uh, to grow without having to grow out. And, uh, and also without having to grow such that it displaces anyone. The land is vacant, and so having having buildings on that vacant land can only bring benefit to the village if done at at the appropriate scale and size. A few other things is uh, this mountains to marsh trail network, which I'll go into a bit. So it's trails, mixed uses, uh, fiber optic internet, and trying to address that interface with the highway and and perhaps add some safety over time there. So what are the ingredients to a successful veil mount? We've identified some of the goals and the priorities. And so we identified five key ingredients for success, which this was kind of our, our, our report card for each, for each OCP land use designated designation. And so you'll see within, within the OCP, each land use designation is evaluated on how they respond to this. And as a collective whole, we believe um, the OCP creates a complete community for bail mount. So we have stores, housing diversity to meet the needs of residents today in the future, fun places, who doesn't want places to play, jobs, it's an essential thing. We notice in our evaluation of the village, a lack of employment areas. There are tourism areas, but there isn't kind of traditional employment or light industrial um, live work opportunities. And, and, and so that's been added. And then sustainable tax revenue. So people want, uh, you know, sustainable taxes that don't go up too high, but also pay for the needs and then perhaps the wants too. So the OCP uh, land use map, the designations are here. They're within your packet, so I won't go into it too much, but key is that village center along Fifth Ave and then three residential areas with unique characters. So we wanna really maintain that, that residential character within the historic residential area. And then, and then unique characters in residential neighborhoods two and three. 
um, a mixed use area in, in what's labeled here as, as a rail town, but it's the main street area. Um, and then identifying in the blue, some employment land. So some are vacant, some could be more, more traditional and industrial. Some, some could be that live work opportunity, which is more innovative um, and more creator based, uh, but adds that economic element to the village that isn't presently very overt. So I'll just go over five, five key topics and I'm probably not giving them enough, enough time here, but that's where the questions are available. And if anyone wants, they can dig into the OCP, of course. So accessory dwelling units, um, the policies within the draft OCP allow these opportunities for accessory dwelling units, laneway homes, basement suites, that kind of thing, all kind of grouped under this umbrella term of accessory dwelling units. Short-term vacation rentals, uh, there is identified as a focus that those should be within the residential neighborhood two and the residential neighborhood three. Uh, so, so that's where the OCP went on that. Parks and trails, so this big idea as mentioned, this mountains to marsh trail system to try to really embed within this village, this love for trails and this love for getting on your bike, this love for walking and, and, and to really connect the village through a trail network. And so one of the key things about that connecting piece is it was mentioned, well, we don't just want to connect the marsh to the mountains, although, although it sound, sounds clever. We want to make sure people are connected to the downtown, to Fifth, Fifth Ave. And so we, we believe that Dogwood is a perfect opportunity to do both of those things. It could be part of this grand trail network, this mountains to marsh, but also it connects the south to the downtown, which is a lacking connection at this time. So Michael drew up this beautiful sketch, which shows the opportunity to really enliven Dogwood with a multi-use pathway. Um, so you have that biking and walking all mixed in with some landscaping to really connect the south to downtown and, and you know, thereby create that key connection, you know, within the village for active modes. Downtown and mixed uses, we mentioned this also a bit, but uh, it was really came from a lot of discussions and commentary with, with citizens as well as staff. Staff had been getting um, a lot of questions from people wanting to utilize their property as both living and working, um, but it was felt that within the downtown, at least this, this streetscape should be a commercial feel but if you wanted to have a residence, it could be above or behind. And that's, that's where the draft policy went. And there's a lot of benefits as we did some analysis to bringing that mixed use environment into your downtown. And you already have it, it's just enhancing it a bit, bit more. So as shown here, the mixed uses are allowed within this uh, red band um, within the land use designations in the OCP which include the core village center as a land use, and then the village center mix, mixed use, which uh, buffers it on either side. Sorry, the colors aren't as, as uh, coming, coming through, through there, so. So I believe opportunity awaits for the village. Uh, this is an exciting new vision in your OCP, and uh, we're happy to be a part of it and happy to field any questions that you may have. So thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt. And thank you to your team as well. Did you have any sort of uh, response under 5.5 .5 to the questions or comments from the public? Michael, do you have any response? I've got a few notes, but I'll pass it off to you as the senior on this team. Yes, thanks, uh, thanks, Mayor Torgensen. You know, you know, I was taken by the commentary. As you know, I I teach at uh, I've taught at uh, Simon Fraser University. I'm an adjunct pref professor there, and I'm also an adjunct professor at Vancouver Island University. Um, 
I think the most important point here is we made every effort within this changing pandemic environment uh, to reach out. Uh, we tried to adjust uh, with the workbook, the circles workbook. Um, we know by that uh, absorption of 700 of these workbooks that the word did get out. We had a hundred responses. I'm very careful in my experience to um, read through and Amy uh, Clark is our engagement um, expert on the team. Uh, we deliberated many times about how we could reach out, how could we keep safe distances, how do we adjust in these um, challenging times. Uh, but we were we carefully measured uh, the responses of the community. I appreciate the long letter uh, and the thought that was put into that um, and the respectfulness of it. Uh, we constantly strive to be inclusive, um, uh, to be respectful, and to be, I, I try to condition my team all the time to say, uh, we have two ears and one mouth to at least listen as twice as much as we speak. Um, so those are, uh, we're always humbled um, by feedback because we can do our best, but best sometimes um, for some people uh, in these trying times is almost an impossible situation. So we appreciate the thoughtfulness in the submission. And it's certainly, um, uh, certainly something we acknowledge, uh, but at the same time, we made every effort in our deliberations, especially with the support group, um, to try to reach out, to try to listen to say, have we got these issues right? Have we articulated them right? And now with the new OCP, the way it's structured, most importantly for council and staff to lead the way to shape that future. So uh, again, um, uh, we, we, we as a team always acknowledge and appreciate uh, submissions and um, uh, uh, but the structure of this OCP and how it was um, how it was scribed was to actually provide an opportunity for the community and staff and council to now shape that future so the game isn't over the game is just starting in terms of shaping your promising future thanks very much uh, Michael uh, 5.6 council, any questions for the presenters this evening? Well, Michael, thank you very much to your team. Uh, I've thoroughly, uh, I can probably speak on behalf of council and I will. <laughs> we thoroughly enjoyed uh, having you along for the ride throughout the last 11 months as we consider uh, the, OS the official community plan later this evening. Yes. Thank you very much on behalf of my team. It was a true pleasure. I, I now have a, a, a soft spot in my heart for Vailmont and uh, I will always be coming back again and again and my team has the same feeling. Thank you. Be good to have you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. I will uh, now adjourn the public hearing. Excuse me. And on to the regular meeting of council being Tuesday, May 11th, 2021. First item on the agenda is to call it to order. And following that, 2.1, adoption of this evening's agenda. Councillor McLean, Councillor G, any additions? Hearing none, all in favor? It's carried. Item 3.1, adoption of the minutes of the regular previous regular meeting being April 27th, 2021. Councilor Blanchett, Councilor G, any errors or omissions arising? Hearing none, all in favor? It's carried. We do have a bit of unfinished business under 5.1 for the Columbia Basin Trust Community Initiatives and Affected Area Program. Funding recommendation for senior housing. Councilor Pearson. I will recuse myself for this one as I'm an executive on the board. Thank you very much.
A couple of recommendations here. Number one, that resolution number 80821 be rescinded. 108. 108. 108. Did I say that or 108? You said 808. Oh, sorry. 808. <laughs> Good. <laughs> 10821 be rescinded. Councillor G, Councillor McLean, any discussion on rescindment? All in favor? It's carried. The second recommendation here that the CBT, CIP, AAP adjudication committee's recommendation that the Vailmount Senior Citizens Housing Society receive 86,775 for their project, Vailmount Cares Phase 2, be approved. Councillor G, Councillor Blanchett, any discussion? All in favor? It's carried. For your info, Councillor, both of those were carried. Okay, thank you. We have some correspondence for action under 6.1 from the Valmont Secondary School uh, regarding the 2021 graduate banners and the recommendation here that staff be directed to work with the Valmont Secondary School to display the 2021 Valmont Secondary School graduate banners on Fifth Avenue. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett, any discussion? Very similar to last year. All in favor? It's carried. Pretty extensive reading file before us this evening. Anything council wishes to plot? Councilor Pearson? Uh, let me find it here. Item number four, uh, the response from um, the government on the 988 emergency uh, hotline, suicide hotline. <clears throat> um, I happy to see that they responded. It's nice to see the acknowledgement. But in reading through, I find it uh, somewhat disheartening that uh, the CRTC is the first, has first right to refusal on this project through their auspices. I, uh, I have real issue with the fact that a CRTC has the option to deny it before it even gets to the table, so. Do you have any measured response? Or would you like to see a, a measured response? Uh, I, would, I would entertain that we uh, respond to that effect. Seconder? Yeah. Councillor Blanchett? Discussion on the motion? All in favor? It's carried. Was there anything further, Councilor Pearson, from the reading file? No, that was all for me, thanks. Thank you very much for raising that. Uh, anything further, Council? On to administrative reports. Under 8.1, we do have a building inspection report to be received for January to April 2021. Councilor Blanchett, Councilor Pearson, discussion? I'm sure the numbers will go up as construction season is upon us. All in favor of receipt? It's carried. 8.2, we do have a recommendation for to sole source supervisory control and data acquisition upgrades. A recommendation here that staff be approved to sole source the SCADA upgrades to ICI Electrical Engineering Limited in the amount of 17770 Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett, discussion? Councillor Blanchett. I just want to remind everyone that we sole source only when we have no, um, when there's a specialist that's involved, and that's this case. We need a specialist to deal with this equipment, so that's why we're sole sourcing. And a terrific traffic record at that. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 8.3 municipal seal coding request for tenure. A couple of recommendations here. The council directs staff to negotiate a contract with Northwest Seal Coating Company in the amount of $174,240 plus taxes for the purposes of seal coating Main Street. Council Blanchett. 
Councillor Pearson. Discussion? All in favor? It's carried. And two, the staff be authorized to negotiate a contract with Northwest Seal Coating Company in the amount of $204,780 for the tax, for the plus taxes for the purpose of the optional items identified in the reports and contingencies if required for Seal Coating Main Street. Councillor Blanchett. Councillor Pearson. Discussion? When, when is a site visit ish to identify the contingencies if necessary? I don't know. I'd have to defer that to the Director of Finance. Uh, Ms. Determined once the contract was approved. Very good. Thank you. We have to discuss the dis Is that satisfactory to Council? Any further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 8.4, we do have a statutory uh, requirement, statutory requirement before us, and that is the appointment of the subdivision approving officer. The recommendation here that Chief Administrative Officer CAO Wayne Robinson be appointed as the statutory approving officer SAO for minor subdivisions, effective May 12, 2021. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor McLean, any discussion? One more. Uh, Mr. Robinson, how, how long do you think you'll be needing to hold that mantle? I would say a minimum of a year. Minimum? Yeah. Thank you. Any further discussion, questions for the administrator? All in favor? It's carried. 8.5, we have a proposed permit, proposed development permit for mixed use Building DP 2101 with a variance for 1451 Fifth Avenue. Recommendation here. Yes. I would like to recuse myself as I'm chair of RVCSS. Very good. And as an employee as well. I Thank you. Too. Recommendation here that council gives initial uh, initial approval to develop development permit 2101 at the property legally described as lot A district lot 7354 plan PGP 32327 for the development of a mixed use building with a variance to permit the following number one increase the building height to 12.8 meters and two decrease the minimum parking requirements to 19 spaces. What's Council's wish? Councillor Pearson. Councillor McLean. Discussion. Councillor Pearson. Um, in, in reading it, I, I agree with the, the variances. I, I have concerns with the, the parking plan as that parking will be on basically on the village easement at the uh, on the fifth avenue side um but in reading this it seems like it'll be a workable solution so did you have an opportunity i had an opportunity to uh, have some discussion with administration over i too had those uh, concerns uh, particularly uh, the uh, snow removal area snow dump area uh, the drainage on the east side being downslope from the Vailmont House Center uh, and uh, and some of the parking requirements in the in the south portion of the of the property but reading more into it I'm more and more satisfied any reflections any further discussion Mr. Administrator. Just, just for Council's uh, knowledge, we can bring this up 
to the uh, the proponent and let them know that these were concerns that were raised and we'll make sure that uh, they, they look at this closely. This is just initial approval. Yes. Yeah. If there's no further discussion, all in favor? It's carried. For your uh, shared uh, info, initial approval has been granted. Okay. Thank you. 8.6 Street Vendor Permit 0321 at 1175th Avenue. There is a recommendation that staff, uh, that final approval, final approval be given for the Funky Goat Eatery to continue operations at its current location of 1175th Avenue, legally described as Lot 2 DL. 9778 Caribou District Plan PGP 35390 for up to three years. Councillor G, Councillor Lanchette, any discussion? I'm sure missed him in 2020. Oh, yeah. He's always respectful of that area and stuff. Yes. Further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Bylaws and policies, number 9.1, item 9.1, five-year financial plan bylaw, number 841-2021. Recommendation here that the five-year financial plan bylaw, number 841-2021, be adopted as presented. Councillor McLean, Councillor Pearson, any discussion on final approval? Final adoption. Councillor Blanchett. Just thank you to uh, Laurie McNair. Uh, Director of Finance, fabulous, fabulous job. Great work as always. Yeah. Further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 9.2, Village of Elmont Official Community Plan Bylaw, number 843-2021. Recommendation here that the Village of Valmont Official Community Plan by Bylaw, number 843-2021, be given third and fourth readings. Councillor G, Councillor Blanchett, discussion. Councillor Blanchett. Thank you to everybody involved. Community is, of course, as well. Um, it's a big process. It's finally done, and I think it uh, represents what we need and want in our growth forward. Really great job. Awesome. Yeah. Further discussion. And just hats off to all of our volunteers at the uh, on our support committee. Uh, Councillor McLean, uh, thank you very much for taking a seat as, as council there. Thank you. Any further discussion? This carries. 9.3 Village of Valemount Street Vendor Bylaw Number 713-2014 Amendment Bylaw Number 844-2021 be given first, second, and third reading. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor Pearson, discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 9.4 Village of Elmont Tax Rate Bylaw Number 845 2021 be adopted as presented. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor Pearson, any discussion? Final adoption? All in favor? It carries. Are there any notices of motion this evening? Council reports. Councilor Blanchett. On the 29th, we had a sign meeting. Um, May 3rd, um, I actually was the first one. I did an inpatient record, health record, um, our design lab interview. I did the first one just to sort of iron out any bugs that we had with that process. Um, everybody has been um, really great. We've got our uh, FAQ sheet out and circulating um, to try and find some more people to pull together and get a whole synopsis of the complete village. 
Um, on the 5th and 6th, we had our NCLG conference, which was really quite interesting because, of course, again, it was over Zoom. We got through all of the resolutions, which was fantastic. They brought in some really great speakers, some good workshops. One of the biggest um, workshops that we had that was um, caused a lot of um, activity was the um, addressing affordable housing and homelessness. And so they couldn't get to all the questions. They, we all, everybody had still a lot of stuff they wanted to discuss. So NCLGA uh, members said that they would try and pull together a webinar that, with BC Housing. So that was um, greatly um, appreciated. So we'll be able to do that. Um, the 10th... Um, myself, Councillor uh, Pearson, um, Silvio Gislombardi, our EDO, and our CAO, Wayne Robinson, we all got in the car and drove around and looked at signs, pretended we were from, you know, somewhere else, and we drove around the whole uh, area and looked at what signs we need, so that's moving along quite well. And on the 10th, I also had a child and youth mental health meeting. That's it. Thank you. Signage. Mm -hmm. Funny. Uh, Councillor McLean. Um, my report is a little longer as I, I was away last meeting, so mine goes all the way back to um, a Vailmont Entertainment Society meeting on April the 20th. Um, it was an exciting meeting. I'm sure most of you have heard by now. We have acquired five new channels um, and they were made available on April the 30th. The channels are 9.101, the Food Network, 9.102, PBS, 9.103, BBC News, KTLA 5, and 99.105, APTN. This brings the number of channels available through your local community rebroadcasters to 16, including our local channel 7. So instructions on how to access these new channels are available on the Valmont Community Television Facebook page. Am I correct? On April the 21st, I attended a, a Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee online webinar um, showing climate change projections for the Columbia Basin. This was interesting but concerning for the future. On April 26th, I attended the council tour of the new community forest industrial yard and the new mill. What the community, what the Vailmont Community Forest Board and staff have accomplished is impressive and is a tremendous asset to this community. Good work and congratulations. On May 6th and 7th, I too attended some online sessions of the North Central Government Association's online annual general meeting and convention. Um, of particular interest for the uh, parts that I was able to tune in for was a session on improving access to health care services in the North Central Local Government Association communities and the challenge that this presents. On May 10th, uh, I attended the opening ceremonies of the online Bringing the Salmon Home Festival. Uh, this festival continues through May 16th, 2021. It's free online. It's an initiative of the Columbia Basin Trust to promote and celebrate the initiative to reintroduce salmon into the rivers of the Columbia Basin. The Indigenous nations of the Columbia Basin, the Government of Canada and the Government of British Columbia have come together to make this a reality. The festival continues for a whole week. If you are interested in attending this free online event, it can be found at columbiariversalmon.ca. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Councillor Pearson? Uh, also on April 29th, uh, along with Councillor Blanchett, CAO Robinson, and uh, EDO Silvio Gislamberti had a signage committee meeting uh, just discussing um, our direction going forward as far as signage in the community to guide traffic and uh, get people moving in the community. Uh, May 4th at a tourism meeting. Uh, the 5th and 6th, I is, as well attended the uh, NCLGA uh, meetings uh, through a, a bit of a new platform. Uh, I think it worked well. Um, and there was some really good presentations on that. It was uh, a good forum. And uh, again, on the 10th, um, guided in the capable driving skills of Councillor Blanchett, we did the uh, signage tour around town and 
chose some locations and and we all survived <laughs> pleased to hear that <laughs> councillor g uh, my report is quite short i've been very busy but i have nothing council related to report very good uh, I, i'm about to mirror your report oh um, <laughs> i attended the nclga uh, virtual convention and uh, with uh, Councillor Pearson, really enjoyed the WOVA chat function. It was an opportunity to really reconnect with some of our colleagues throughout the North, and, and without that, um, you know, it wasn't just one or two virtual lounges, it was topic specific, so you could dive into a room and hash things out uh, with some pretty cool ideas out there. Uh, May 6th, I had a northern region call with Ministers Osborne and Bear on, you guessed it, connectivity <laughs> in, northern, in, in northern BC. Um, some of the, they, they highlighted some of the successes and of course, uh, our colleagues across the north have identified the many, many challenges that still remain. Uh, today, uh, a couple of things had a, uh, you know, discussion with the administrator around public hearings and, and the council agenda uh, for this evening. Uh, had a briefing with Belmont Emergency Services and much to everyone's chagrin, uh, the BC State of Provincial Emergency has been extended today to May 25th. So, the, But uh, excitingly turned, uh, tuned into the provincial announcement for the amendments to the Employment Standards Act. Um, workers, if exhibiting COVID-19 symptoms, may take three days paid sick leave uh, to avoid the dilemma between a paycheck and the health and well-being of their co-workers. The employer, in turn, is reimbursed through WorkSafe BC. So really good to hear that that made some traction and, and will be worked into legislation. Motion to receive. Questions, comments? Oh, Councilor Pearson, sorry. <laughs> Actually, just a quick comment on uh, Councilor McLean's report on the uh, re the uh, returning of the salmon. Uh, there was a nice little art, uh, item on CKPG News tonight about Spruce Capital Fish Fisheries, and uh, they are have become like the most high tech uh, fish raising plant um, in BC for sure. And they are raising Swift Creek salmon, so there was a nice, nice little shout out for them. So, further discussion comments. All in favor? Oh, who? who Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett. Discussion. All in favor? Receipt. Carried. Are there any public comments as received on, considered by council as part of the approved agenda? There are no public comments. We will not be proceeding to in camera this evening, so I'll call for adjournment. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, council.